Uh, we sent an email already just as a disclaimer that we will be recording this conference. Um, so my name is Lauren Castellino and I'm the founder and executive director of Pitch It Green. I know that there are many participants joining us from all around the world and my team and I are so excited to be having this conference about sustainability and business from our part of the world in Toronto, Canada. And we hope that wherever you are in the world, you take away something from our conference. Uh, before our conference begins, we would like to offer our deep condolences to all the families and friends of George Floyd, ah Ahmed Arbery, Breonna Taylor, and countless others that have been murdered at the hands of a global system that seeks to destroy the Black community, control their identities, and extinguish their voices. In order to make these voices heard, Pitch It Green is up updating its founding pillars of environmentalism and entrepreneurship to include more information on racism, intersectionality, and sustainable ventures started by Black, Indigenous, and people of color. Over the past few weeks, the Pitch It Green team has been actively reading, learning, and listening to the voices of those who need us, and we encourage you to stay educated as well. As an organization that promotes sustainable, responsible business, we are strong believers of social responsibility and believe that change is not only necessary for the better of the environment, but also for society and the people who suffer from ignorance. We stand with all the Black, Indigenous, and people of color and strive to offer our utmost support for them during these difficult times. To include our statement, we invite you all to join us in a moment of silence and reflection, both to respect the countless lives lost and to reflect on how we can all inspire change in our communities. So we'll just have a minute of silence. All right, thank you so much. Um, so moving on to our agenda, we'll be having a keynote, a panel discussion, and a networking session, as there are three main aspects of our event. And we'll also have a small breakout after the panel. Um, but just so that you can learn more about us and what we do, we'll just do a little intro to Pitch It Green. Um, so we're a youth-led nonprofit comprised of students, mostly in university and high school. And our mission is to uh, bridge the disconnect between youth environmentalism and entrepreneurship by connecting youth with sustainability focused business opportunities. And our vision is to create the next generation of ecopreneurs by hosting conferences and workshops where young people can learn about the intersection of business and the environment, hosting sustainability pitch competitions where you can learn how to improve your public speaking skills, and content creation where young people can write about ecopreneurship uh, eco through interviewing local ecopreneurs. Um, some of our key areas include pitching, educating, mentoring, and networking. At most of our events, there's opportunity to pitch, to learn more about sustainability, to receive mentorship from industry leaders, and to network with students and business professionals in Toronto and the GTA. Um, so far, just like a little timeline of uh, where we've been, um, we supported local ecopreneurs by selling their products in our ecopreneur boxes. We hosted our first ever sustainability pitch competition and green business conference, and even had the opportunity to lead some workshops at high schools and independent conferences. Next, I am pleased to introduce our keynote speaker, Aaron Spivak. Aaron is a serial entrepreneur co-founding Revitasize, an organic cold pressed juice kitchen serving high quality juices, smoothies, acai bowls, and a variety of vegan options. Aaron has also co-founded a sleep improvement company called Hush, 
which has become one of Canada's fastest growing e-commerce companies in 24 months. Without further ado, I'd like to welcome our keynote speaker, Aaron Spivak. Hello, can you guys hear me? Yep. Awesome, well, thank you so much for having me. Uh, start, yeah, let me start that. Yeah, I think you have to start your video, okay. Great. Well, I got the Tiger King background, love it. All right, there we go. Hey everybody, thank you for uh, giving up your time to uh, hear me speak. That means a lot, for sure. Um, great start, Lauren. I'm happy I was uh, there for the first part. Glad I didn't miss it. Uh, right on point. Um, yeah, for those who don't uh, know me or what I do, uh, bio is the overview. But um, yeah, in, in 2013, uh, we launched Provider Size uh, out of my mother's basement. And uh, out of pure uh, need for ourselves. We just wanted to feel better. Uh, I was I was an athlete. My brothers were athletes, so we used uh, juicing predominantly, but healthy eating and and sustainable eating actually as a method of um, growth and improvement, uh, selfishly for our sport. And then it kind of snowballed into people around us, uh, and then we started seeing the need that you know, uh, at the time, 2013, where you know there was no vegan restaurants. Every alter there was no alternative. Um, we wanted to be some level of an outlet for people to have access to real food and sustainable organic food um, that, you know, now in 2020, you know, it's every menu has vegan options and there's all, there's all these different options, but back in 2013, it was just not, not available to anyone. So uh, we took that upon ourselves almost seven years ago now, how fast time flies. And um, in the middle of all that, I you know we, I also noticed the lack of sleep for many people. So we went and uh, we launched Hush in twenty January of twenty eighteen, and on the basics that we could uh, improve at the time um, an unrecognized global issue, which is lack of sleep. Um, you know, one one in three of Canadians are uh, suggesting that they don't get seven or more hours of sleep. Uh, one in four suggesting that they're, they're anxious or uh, suffer from levels of anxiety. So we knew we had to make a difference. We knew we couldn't change the entire world, but uh, one step at a time, um, we can change one person at a time. So that's kind of been the evolution and uh, we can get right into it here. Uh, do I have control or do you have control? I'll just change it. Uh, okay, I love it. All right, so, uh, oh yeah, kind of went through this, 1823, yeah. I kind of just went over all this. Uh, we can kind of skip it unless anyone wants to read it. Um, yeah, so, I mean, uh, Lauren can probably attest, but uh, I forget when the original date was, uh, I think it was prior to the pandemic, it was gonna be in person. Uh, and the topic was slightly different. So I kind of combined both. Um, I forget what the exact uh, issues we were covering prior to the pandemic, but obviously we are in pandemic times now. So uh, navigating and pivoting and changing and understanding that things aren't the same and they most likely will not go back to being the same and accepting it and trying to find ways to adapt and, and make positive change because for a lot of people and a lot of businesses and a lot of organizations, the pandemic was extremely tough um, and still is tough. Um, I think we're going to see a huge change in the way we do a lot of business, uh, specifically sustainable business, um, which is what we're going to highlight here. Right thing, one thing off the top is the supply chain. So, you know, who remembers, I don't know if 
anyone has mute or everyone's muted or not, but who remembers when the pandemic hit, all the grocery stores were empty. And there was no, like, I remember I went into Loblaws and there was like just no fruits, no vegetables. And I was like, oh my God, what's going on? And everybody was panicking and like horror buying. And there was this overall consensus that there wasn't enough food. Like we were like we were gonna run out of food. People were hoarding toilet paper and stuff as if we were never gonna get a reload. Uh, and it was just gonna like end and we were gonna live off beans and rice forever. Um, but actually the opposite happened. Uh, we have an excess amount of food. Uh, the only issue was that there wasn't enough people at Loblaws to restock the shelves in time. So it created this false sense of insecurity amongst, amongst the general population, including myself, until I had to kind of like talk to people and realize that um, consumerism uh, from the grocery stores is not actually what moves the needle for, uh, for food for large scale gro uh, groceries and, and fruits and vegetables and everything in between. It's actually restaurants and catering companies and event companies. For example, uh, a restaurant that will do uh, $10 million a year in sales needs, goes through more food than all of Markham, right? So uh, from a grocery standpoint, so that's just one restaurant. Imagine, you know, in Toronto alone, there's over 10 different chains of restaurants that are well above excess of $10 million a year. So not including the catering companies that, you know, have two to $3 million of payrolls of cooks and, and all these people that process and there's so much waste involved. Um, and all of that stopped, but the food was still farmed and still produced. So there was actually an excess in food. And the sad part is, which is, you know, why I want to talk about the supply chain and food insecurity is that a lot of that food actually didn't go anywhere. And um, many restauranters, restauranteurs actually um, kind of went under the radar was there was nothing to do with all this food. We had so much food and it didn't feel like that from the consumer perspective. We all felt like we were never going to see an orange ever again. And on the, on the reality was that there was so much. So I, I wanted to address that because I know that that's probably not common knowledge. Um, and we felt kind of the opposite, but the good news is, is that um, a lot of players uh, in the, in the produce space are, um, are actively taking sustainable measures. Uh, a lot of our organic suppliers that we work with um, were actually uh, trying to provide us discounts, uh, trying to give us uh, incentive. We recently launched um, a blood orange juice, which uh, actually tastes really good. We've never launched something like that before. And uh, we did it on the back that uh, the supplier put in an order to get farmed a long time ago before the pandemic. And now he's got all these oranges and it's impossible to sell. The restaurants are closed. Or if, they, if they're open, they're, you know, they're operating at 20 to 40% of their capacity. So um, we were able to kind of, you know, get that, get those oranges at a significant discount, use a lot of them. So we made a pure orange juice and then we sold it at a discount too. So then, it, you know, the whole chain feeds off the sustainable model of, you know, we get it at a discount. We don't throw any food out. Consumer buys it at a discount. They enjoy the, they enjoy the healthy food. And it's just a circle of that. And there's a lot of programs and a lot of charities and stuff that are hopping on board to continue to f move the supply chain because if we do get an overload at any point, it's kind of like a pipe that'll burst. Um, so those those are the two things that are, I guess, super important in terms of that. Um, just give me one second.
Oh, okay, sorry. Sorry about that. Um... Oh, there you go. Okay, cool. Yeah, I just, I couldn't unmute myself. Uh, all good. Anyway, so another uh, pivot I want to make. So from that, that's from the food and security standpoint, I guess common knowledge now is, um, is team building during, uh, during a pandemic because it's extremely sensitive. Um, if you were in an office, we are working from home. Um, the standards are different. The way we conduct ourselves is different. The way we communicate is different. And how do we effectively do it to the point where we're still able to build some level of culture, right? Because when we're in person, we're in together, we can do a lot of team building stuff. We can eat lunch together. Uh, we see, we hear, uh, we're constantly around each other. There's a vibe to it, right? It's like, you know, some people say, I have my work family, and then I have my home family. It's easy to build when we're constantly around each other. When we're all looking at a screen all day. It's much more difficult to build. And we have less reasons to communicate, right? Other than, you know, if we have a scheduled call or a non-scheduled call, there's just, there's less touch points over and over and over again. And if there is any sort of constant touch point, we're finding that we're doing it through, you know, Slack or some form of messaging um, that doesn't necessarily build high quality culture. So a few techniques that, that, uh, that I implemented uh, for our work from home family is, um, creating a space where we don't talk about work. And the way we do it is we allocate space to talk about work. So we get that out of the way. And then we allocate space to not talk about work. And then when we first kind of level into the pandemic, I, there was a constant trend to like, how are we gonna monitor our employees? How are we gonna monitor each other? So a lot of people start downloading apps like Hubstaff, which basically tracks the screen activity, all these kind of metrics. And we started realizing that uh, when we're building a team, we're working together on projects. Uh, it doesn't necessarily matter the micro. And, and the micro is, oh, you, you were supposed to work eight hours today, but you know, it says you only work six and a half. So let's have a whole conversation about that. Right. And we find that companies and organizations that continue to do that over and over and over and over and over again actually don't end up at their macro goals. So we have macro goals, right? In any business, we want, you know, any business, any organization, any project, anything you're doing, you set up these goals, or you should at least, you know, we can get into a whole goal setting thing later on, but you should have your goals, whether it's first quarter goals, second quarter goals, yearly goals, half year goals, 10 year goals, whatever it is, you want to set that up because that's what you want to work towards. And the way I do my goal setting is once I set that goal, I work backwards. So for example, let's say I had a goal of, I wanted to sell 1000 blankets, even though that's not a goal, but for simple math, instead of saying, okay, I want to sell a thousand blankets. Okay. Everybody let's work harder. Let's do more marketing. Let's do more product research. Let's get out there in the streets. Let's educate people. Let's do more emails. Instead of doing that, which is the micro approach, micro approach of just working harder today and tomorrow and this week in hopes that we reach our end goal, I do the complete reverse. I go, okay, if I want to sell a thousand blankets, how many customers do I need? Right. And we have, we have an average rate of, of 1.8 times uh, purchase, which means we're working to two. Hopefully everyone buys twice in their lifetime, lifetime value. So, if I need a thousand blankets, I need a roughly, you know, 400 to 450 customers. Okay. 450 customers. What's our cost to acquire a customer? And we keep going kind of backwards and backwards and backwards to the point where it's like, okay, all we need to do is hit these little small little micro goals together and it'll come together to hit our macro goals. So then when we're building a team, we focus on things that actually move the needle and that are actually relevant to our process. And if you have a team of two, it's the same thing because there's so much time in our day that we spend on things that don't actually move the needle to allow us to achieve our goals. We spend a lot of time doing things, doing work. And sometimes it's meaningful and sometimes you feel it and sometimes you sweat and whatever it is. But a lot of our time isn't spent because we kind of forget about the macro. It's so hard to constantly just like look up to this thing that's just there and you hope you hit it because you'll feel good. 
but we forget that the, pro the, the joy in hitting the goal is actually the entire process. The joy in, in getting big and strong was all those workouts you did, right? So when we're building a team, we remove the fact of the micro is what did you do today or what did you do this week? And we get into the fact is, okay, what do we need to do collectively together to win this week, to win this small little week, to win today? And then do we, can, we, can we look back this week together as a team and be happy and proud of ourselves of where we started on Monday to where we finished on Friday? And if we're not, can, can we be empathetic enough to each other to understand maybe why we didn't? reach where we wanted to reach and that's how we're building team because it's okay not to not to hit your goals for the week for the month for the quarter all that's okay but can we do it with with love and with empathy towards each other with the basic understanding that we all mean well right and obviously there's odd circumstances where you have that eight ball and there's all these anomalies but for the most part we all truly want the best for each other and for ourselves. So if we can get to that common understanding, then we remove a lot of the emotion. And I mean, my next point is pivoting and removing the emotion. It goes right into that is we actually remove the emotion and we, and we remove the, the pain that we feel when we feel we're pulling our weight and someone else is not. We remove the pain where uh, I don't know what I'm doing. I'm not confident. Now I'm not, not really excited to do my work. You remove the pain where I don't really like this work, maybe. And all that comes when we're able to be open and work together. You know, I have times in my, in my, in my team where I'll notice someone on our team who just kind of like not really into what their tasks are, not really into their job. And, you know, I'll just be like, hey, like, do you want to do something else? Right. Instead of and, and if we don't do that pivot and remove the emotion, then we just start getting angry. Like, why isn't Christopher doing his stuff? Why is he doing his stuff? He's not doing it. He's not doing it. And Christopher's getting down on himself. Oh, I don't like this stuff. I'm not doing it. I'm not doing it. And the entire snowball starts to erupt. And everyone else in the team is now feeling the lack of Christopher, you know. And unless we can be open and honest and truthful with one another, then again, the, the end goal never gets met. And that's what I mean by removing the, the emotion. And when we pivot, like a time, like a pandemic, everyone gets very emotional. In fact, I don't know anyone who hasn't cried during this pandemic, right? Because there's just so much going on and a lot needs to change. What you thought was the right thing in January and February may not be the right thing anymore. What you thought moved the needle, what your goals were to start the year, may not be the right goals anymore and for a lot of people including myself there's an ego attached to those goals there's an ego attached to what you thought was right and there's an ego to what has worked for you in the past and if you can't remove yourself from that you can't remove the emotion you're going to end up on the wrong side of this pandemic and i truly believe whatever business you're in i have a friend who does he has a $200 million catering business across all of Canada. It's, it's one of the largest catering companies in all of Canada. And he's making zero dollars right now because every single office, every single event, every single wedding, every anything, it all shut down. He's making zero dollars. And he told me, he's like, I can go into, I can put myself in a position where I just sit there every day and cry until there's events again. And even if there are events again, they're not going to have as many people and everything's just going to be less. He's like, or I can pivot because people love my food. They always have loved my food. And I can, I can bring it to their house in smaller portions. I can service their dinners. I can start tackling smaller things. And yes, my business is not going to be $200 million ever again. But if I can't remove my emotion to that, my pride, my ego, and being able to say that, then I'm just going to stay here at zero. And it was really powerful for me to see because if he's, if he, he told me he took a full month for even to even think that that idea was worth it because you're so tied to things that you believe in. And I mean, kind of ties back into what's going on in the world right now. 
and how so many people are unattaching themselves from beliefs and from ideas that we were so accustomed to. And, you know, everyone's, everyone's saying they're learning, but everyone's also saying that they're unlearning, which is super powerful. I'm unlearning things that I thought were true. And that applies so much into business. And it, it's the evolution of life. You have to allow yourself to continue to change and change. And it's okay to, you know, say, I thought it was green and then come back and say, I'm so sorry, guys, it was blue the whole time. It takes a real person, a real strong person to admit that they need to change their mind. And there's no harm in that. And you might have a couple of people not enjoy it, but there's really no harm in that. And that applies to business so powerfully. To make a decision today and realize in a week from now that it was a bad decision and own it and adapt and learn from it is way more powerful than to just see it through because of all these unnecessary emotions you have. So. Another thing on my next point, it goes, avoid the unhappy and the unlucky. Uh, this is ever so true in a pandemic. There's going to be so many people around you that come and go in your circle, not in your circle that are just un extremely unhappy. There's no way you can cut it. You can't, you've tried to make them happier. They're just unhappy. And it seems that just bad things continue to happen to them, at least from the stories that they tell you or from what you're able to see. And it's constantly happening to them. Obviously, friends and family are not included in this, in this saying I'm about to say, but uh, you need to completely detach yourself. And it's a little bit harsh, I know, I get it. Nobody wants to, you know, everybody wants to help. If someone's unhappy and unlucky. I want to do whatever I can to help them. I want to support them, right? But there also comes a point where you need to set up your boundaries because specifically in times like this, I've had to detach myself from specific, you know, business partners that I've had long relationship with. And, you know, there might be in different sections or different niches, but we always talk and try to come back and forth with ideas similar to like we're doing right now that I'd like to learn from. And um, they've just been super negative. The whole world's, you know, going down the drain. Every the, the house is burning. One thing is going wrong. Next time I talk to them, three more other things went wrong, and everything is just wrong, and it's bad, and it's negative, and we're never going to get out of this, and this is the worst situation ever, and my family's going to suffer. It's just bad and bad and bad and bad and bad, and then it's because they're not doing the points above. They're not pivoting. They're not team building. They're not realizing that they can remove the emotion. And you need to, you, you do need to avoid. It's unfortunate, but um, it's a part of protecting your own inner psyche uh, because it's super easy to start believing them. It's, you know, it's super easy to start saying, you know what, maybe they are uh, suffering as much as we are. And you start getting into that negative mindset, which is extremely dangerous. So don't want to talk too much about that, but just pay attention to those it could be anyone. It could be a random person you see and you talk and you're catching up with and you're like, whoa, well, I got to be a little bit outside of that. So um, the last one is crush your enemy totally. <laughs> if you know, if you know, if you follow me, you know anything about me, that's what I say often. But if you don't, you're like, this guy's nuts. Um, so it's, it's business, right? And in business, when you're expecting specifically a pandemic, the market share in any niche has shrunk we're all buying less there's no any no way to cut it we're just we're consuming less we're eating out less we're eating in less or even if we are online shopping it's just less everything is less the market share has shrunk you'll see a lot of brands take this opportunity to absolutely destroy uh, any enemy they had it's an unfortunate truth um, it, it's actually very healthy for, for the, from an economic standpoint, uh, it forces change. And, um, if you're in, you know, if you're in a position where you have competition right now, direct competition, uh, you need to take this opportunity to, uh, really look at your competitors and hopefully you're in a, you're in a more positive position. Uh, I know from our perspective, uh, we've noticed that our, our, our right when the pandemic hit, 
a lot of our competitors uh, reduce their ad spend, which means, you know, the amount of money they spend on Facebook and Instagram and Google and influencers, the amount of money that they spend to bring in new business. We can track that digitally. So we keep an eye on it and, you know, we're constantly going up and up and up together with them. When the pandemic hit, they hit the panic button, right? They, they, they weren't able to remove the emotion. They hit the panic for whatever reason. And we noticed that they pulled out of a lot of sections and we actually doubled down and took those sections over completely. And now it's, it's almost impossible for them to rejoin. It is a little bit harsh, but it's important to understand that um, the way pandemics work, there's, there's opportunity within all the mess and all the smoke. And uh, if you do have the opportunity, try your best to see clearly through the smoke, try to find your opportunities because they are everywhere. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm learning new opportunities every single day. Last is mindset, which is kind of this whole thing. Uh, mindset times a thousand. Uh, how strong can we be mentally? I work on my uh, mental psyche pretty much one to two hours every single day, whether it's uh, meditation, whether it's, uh, whether it's books, whether it's learning, whether it's talking to, to, to other people in different niches and different areas. Uh, I have, I've started a little run club in Toronto. If you're in Toronto and you want to run with us, we just run and talk and learn. Everyone's doing different things. It's so it's so new. We start to stay six feet apart. Don't worry. And, um, and it, it's really about mindset because the news business, the economics, the leadership, the countries, everything is just a lot right now. There's just so much going on and you don't know what's right and you don't know what's wrong. You know, I was like, I like posted something and then everyone's like, it was bad. And I was like, oh my God, I don't know what I'm doing. Like, you know what I mean? Like Lauren's like, his, his speech in the beginning, it's like, I'm sure she worked so hard on that because she's like, it, it's so hard to know like what's right and what's wrong. You don't want to say the wrong thing. And it's like, there's just a lot. And if we start falling apart in here, uh, everything else will start. Every single thing I mentioned above, and I guess I could talk about things for days, right? Um, you start to realize that it crushes everything else. You cannot build a team if you are boggled up inside your head. You cannot find the weaknesses of your enemy if you're boggled up inside of your head. You cannot avoid unhappy people because you might be that unhappy person. So it's almost impossible to do anything constructive and to try to, try to see, see clear. And like I said prior, you can change. Like I change my mind all the time. Like yesterday, I was like, we need to, you know, do some form of advertising. We want to do some stuff in the gardener. And then today I woke up and I was like, mm, probably a stupid idea. Not going to do it. And then it's okay to change. You know, maybe the person who I told to do, they might be like, that guy's annoying. He said yes yesterday, no today. But the reality is, is we're allowed to change and we're allowed to see clearly. And if we work on our mindset, um, I know the photo here has the boss and the leader. That's just pure mindset because they both keep the train moving, but if you can see clear here, you can help those around you and you can elevate everybody up. Now, do I think I'm 1000% clear? No, but I know that I'm working on it, right? Which is step one. And if we, if we work on it together with the people around us, we start to elevate and elevate and elevate. And I mean, for Hush, um, you know, our business has, has scaled significantly uh, during the pandemic because we did we did workshops we did mental workshops with our staff for two weeks we said no work for two weeks when the pandemic started and we're all just going to work on ourselves you know, some people did excel courses some people did mental courses i did like a bunch of meditation courses like people started reading books and i was like we're just going to work on ourselves we'll come back we'll clear the smoke we'll figure it out because like nobody wants to work when in the middle of a pandemic you don't even know if you can see your mom and dad like this, this is nuts right and for Revita, like our stores, you know, saw way less traffic. And then I was like, okay, let's push people to our online store. We'll deliver it to their house. And originally no one wanted to do that because you want people to come in your store. Makes sense. Um, and I was like, okay, like we need to make that pivot. And we did. And it, and it lifted our business up again amongst, you know, the unpopular decision because it's very dangerous to take people away out, out from the store and leave them at home. So it's, it all comes back to mindset and to supporting those around you and to understanding that it's okay to make mistakes. It's okay to screw up. It's okay to not want to work today. Like it's all fine because the macro, which is what we're all trying to achieve. And for some people, it's just internal. That's me. I'm just eternal happiness. 
I like, I just trying to figure out whatever moves my needle and my needle is like, uh, what can make me happy, right? Like talking to you guys right now, even though like everyone's muted and all, it's making me happy. So like, for me, Saturday, everyone's outside, you know, if they're in Toronto, they're panning or whatever. I'm here just like, I, I have joy, right? So find what that joy for you. And if you're lucky enough to find joy in your business or in your job and in your, you know, in the way you make money, super. But, and if you're not, then you'll find it. It's a journey, right? And shit makes me unhappy all the time. So, uh, yeah, that's it for my, um, my key issues. I can go on forever, but I know we're on a time, uh, time constraint. I probably went over. Well, thank you so much, Aaron, for such an informative keynote. I know the attendees probably had a lot to take away from that. Um, does anyone have any questions for Aaron? You can uh, leave it in the chat. Um, and I think Aaron will just take a look at it and um, just answer. So just feel free to leave any comments. Anybody? In the, uh, oh, in the chat. Okay. Yeah, on the chat. And just be sure to share it with everybody so we can see. Oh, Austin. Cool. Hey. Wow. It's an awesome question. Great question. Um, I think um it, that's that answer is going to be different uh for everyone my trick is um i find the people that uh i i aspire to be them or to be some form of them so i treat the books the resources the podcasts um as recipes to like a dish so for example i just got into like running uh, I'm starting to like take my, my personal health really seriously during this pandemic. And I love this guy. His name's David Goggins. He's like an insane runner. Like his mindset is like a brick. The guy's like, just doesn't stop. So I was like, okay, I'm going to start following this guy. I read his book. I listen to, I watch him on Instagram and stuff. I don't, I don't like everything he does, but for running, I take his, I take the nuggets from him. And then you know, for the way I deal with like my friends and my family, I follow this guy's name's Jesse Itzler. And, um, you know, if you know him, if you don't, he's sold Zico and Marquee Jet and all that stuff. He's a self, self-made entrepreneur. So from that aspect, I obviously inspire him, but the way he shares and he deals with his family and he, he talks to his children and um, he's, he has a huge emphasis on the value of time. And he's really taught me how important time is. So, you know, I use him for that. He always reminds me how important time is. Um, I love, I love Gary Vee because he always reminds me to, to, to stay emotional. Uh, sometimes, you know, as entrepreneurs, we want to get hard and we want to stay, you know, we want to stay strong and stuff like that. So I use him, I use him for that. Uh, I use Dave Asprey for, for, um, he's, he's the bulletproof guy. He talks about different supplements. So I'm always interested in new supplements and stuff on how I can help myself. So I, I, I would say, if you're if you're an aspiring entrepreneur um and you're and you're a student and you're, and you're pre-idea so like you're not you don't have something that you're working on already uh just do basic research i would check guys out like gary v and stuff like that and i would see you know who resonates with you and what 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 makes you feel good uh and it's okay to change like i've when i was younger i was all like i was gary v before he was on instagram i was on gary v when he was just twitter he used to respond to my dms and stuff and um as i got more advanced and as my business started to grow gary became less uh I, I resonated less with gary we didn't really have much in common anymore he was speaking to more starters and i was at a different stage um but i use him for other things so when you're kind of like kind of build your cocktail is what i would say it's just like make make that mixed drink that works for you and if you whatever you're into right? Like I've, I've, you know, my partner's super interested into gaming. He's like a gaming fanatic. So he always is like, you know, he's following these gaming guys and stuff like that, you know? So just dive into what your cocktail is and then kind of just pull your nuggets, what works for you. I don't, I wouldn't say copy or follow anyone religiously. I don't think anyone really does anyways, but uh, yeah, that cocktail helps for me. 
uh, like in mindset, I do a ton of Tony Robbins stuff. I'm like, I read his book like four times. Um, my current book I'm reading now is called The 48 Laws of Power. Actually, avoid the unhappy and the unlucky is one of those. Actually, wow, I didn't even realize this. Holy, avoid the unhappy and unlucky is one of those laws and crush your enemy totally is a paraphrase of one of the laws as well, which is an incredible book about uh, you'll start to pay attention on how you talk to people and stuff like that. But yeah, that's a great question. All right, so if there are no other questions, thank you, Aaron, so much once again for your keynote. Now we're gonna get into the panel and Selena will actually be leading that. So I will just um, turn on Selena's microphone, if this will work. It worked. Where are you? <laughs> okay. Yay, your video's on, okay. Okay, great. Um, hi everyone, I'm Selena Fu. I'm the Chief Communications Officer of Fitcher Green and I'll be leading the panel discussion today. And I'd like to welcome our panelists, um, Kelly Saltzman, Nikki Salv, Tara Tomolka, and Sarah Green. And I don't think I can ever do justice introducing them, so if they can introduce themselves, that'd be really, really great. Sorry, I'm just like turning on the video oh. stuff now. Oh. Sorry, this might take a bit of time. Oh, it's fine. Anyway, um, they're all really great entrepreneurs in the green business sector. And just for in a little bit, when we start a discussion, just know that you, every, anyone can jump in, like panelists, when they feel like there's an interesting thought that relates to a question, there's no need to like um, be polite, you know what I'm saying? Just keep the conversation going, you know what I mean? Hi. Hello. Hi. Hey. Hi, Sarah. Hey, how's it going? Good, how are you? Good. Um, so let's see who's on. Is everyone unmuted and on, Lauren? It looks like it, yeah. Yes, that's good. Okay, great. Um, if everyone can introduce themselves, then we can get this discussion started. Cool, I can start. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Kelly Saltzman. I'm the co-founder of Awoke and Aware. We're a sustainable and ethically produced apparel company. Uh, we launched about a year and a half ago now, which is really exciting. Um, and our business started with the purpose to help vulnerable wildlife. So we donate 15% of our profits to different wildlife conservations for uh, each item sold. Well, that's, hi, everybody. My name is Nikki Self. I am a co-founder of Sapinetti. We are a uh, soap refill delivery service here in Toronto. We uh, started in 2016 with the uh, goal in mind, we wanted to make it easy for people uh, and accessible to be able to uh, get household cleaners, personal care products in refillable containers to avoid uh, that whole horrific conundrum of the blue bin that we're dealing with uh, right now. So uh, yeah, that's basically our business in a nutshell. Thank you so much. Tara? Hi everyone, I'm Tara Tomolka. I'm a holistic nutritionist and founder of Rockology. Our mission is to create inclusive, organic, and nutritious plant-powered foods that can be enjoyed by all individuals regardless of dietary restrictions. So we have four flavors of grain-free granolas and four flavors of coconut chips that are all organic, vegan, low sugar, and free from the top 11 allergens including nuts, gluten, and dairy. Hey. And hey, I'm Sarah, and I'm the founder of Scrunchies from Scraps. And basically what I do is kind of like what the name says. So I create scrunchies out of scrap fabric that otherwise would go to waste. So I've teamed up with local dressmakers and tailors to take their fabric scraps and then upcycle them into fun uh, hair accessories. That's what I do. That's really neat, like <laughs> everyone on the panel. Um, so if you guys don't mind, I'll delve into the question. So number one is, how has the pandemic impact your business model? If you had to pivot 
um, the ways you're doing things, like how are you pivoting? Everybody's so polite. <laughs> I'll just, I'll, I'll. Oh, so is it in the questions in the chat? No. Oh, it looks like Kelly might be muted. Yeah. I'll jump in. Um, when we, when in March we were operating as a delivery business and also we had a, uh, we were open to foot traffic. So we had customers bringing in their own containers. We would tear and we fill them with their products and they would go on their way. Um, that was uh, probably about 60% of our sales were uh, walk-in customers. Um, but as we realized that this was becoming a very serious problem, uh, we decided before there were any government regulation recommendations, we shut down our door to focus on our delivery model because we already were doing that. So it was kind of an easy sort of transition um, for us to, to do that. But one of the things that was a big kind of surprise for us is that our, our, our sales shot up literally overnight by 400%. It was a little bit, as it was a bit of a, a, a trial as a small company to, to kind of keep up with that kind of level of growth. So we had to kind of uh, change a lot of our, um, how we were, how we were refilling, how we were, how we were doing operating in the background because now we weren't taking people's containers. We were having more bottles in our stock to have to refill and to deliver. So, so a lot of things increased on one side, plus some expenses went up um, for us. And then on, and on, on the other side, we, we had a lot of benefit of a lot of people looking for alternatives since they weren't able to go to the store. They weren't able to uh, get their products as they usually were. Um, in previous, you know, pre-pandemic times. So, so for us, we just had to kind of pivot a tiny bit. It wasn't a big, wasn't a big step for us. So we were really grateful for that in, in our experience. Um, I can step in. So we didn't have a big pivot either. Um, luckily, we started our business with being uh, e-commerce first, uh, mobile first. So everything was already set up to run online. Um, Luckily, we did stock up inventory right beforehand because we were supposed to be at a at a big eco event that ended up getting canceled. So we have a lot of the inventory. The biggest issue there is the inventory is all in our 600 square foot condo. So we're living with a lot of product, but um, it does make it easy because same sort of thing as Nikki, our sales went um, through the roof pretty quickly after. So um, it's easy that the product was just within our place so we could ship it out a lot quicker um, instead of having to go to like another facility and um, you know slow down the process a little bit. I'll speak next. So so Rockology primarily sells our plant-based snacks in grocery stores. So we did notice a decline in grocery sales in April and May, largely with our food distributors. And we think this is likely because shoppers were prioritizing staple items over snack foods. But in turn, we saw this huge increase in our online sales. So historically in January, 2020, and previously in 2019, online sales were only less than 10% of our business. And we saw this shift to 25% in March, 75% in April, and then 60% in May. So that includes sales on our website, rockology.com, as well as Amazon and other retailers. Um, but we've also seen a number of new online, online grocery retailers emerge in this time too. So they have started carrying our products as well. So sites like thebreakfastpantry.com. And then we've also seen other CPG businesses shift to include products in their portfolios. So one company's uh, Greenhouse Juice launched their Greenhouse Pantry, which now stocks our products. And then another company, Lemon Lily Tea, now has a healthy market carrying our products. So in terms of how we've pivoted, we've really focused on building a strong digital presence and evaluating how we can strengthen our existing website and social media platforms and lever leverage our partnership network. And with that said, in the past, we really haven't focused on our e-commerce strategy. And given this new environment, 
We're in the process of now migrating our site over to Shopify. We recently hired a web developer to help us with this and so that we can have this better user experience for our customers. And then another huge way that um, we're pivoting is in terms of product sampling. So a key way that people find out about us is uh, they try our products when we do in-store demos at stores, but we can no longer do that right now. So we're focusing on how we can get packaged food samples out to customers to try our products. Cool. So oh, I can say, sorry, sorry oh. Stan, to cut you off. I just wanna say one thing to Tara. I used to work at a, a CPG company and I also work at Shopify, so I have some like tips in my brain. So if you want to connect afterwards, I'm also happy to chat a little bit. <laughs> yes, please. That'd be amazing. Okay. Thank you. Okay, so I'll just jump in as well. And I think similar to Nikki and Kelly, I didn't have to pivot too much for my business as I sell mainly online through Etsy. I do do some markets, but that's kind of something I was planning on doing later in the summer anyways. But actually the interesting thing for me was that although I get, I have tons of fabric scraps right now, so that's not a concern, but the one thing that I do purchase is the elastic that I use for scrunchies. And if I, I imagine a lot of you have seen nowadays with the reusable mass that this elastic actually has become a super hot commodity. And um, I didn't realize that at the time when I was first looking to restock up on my elastic, um, this was, I guess, just as the masks were starting to really come out. So when I was looking online to restock and I see it sold out and I'm looking everywhere and I'm not being able to find it as I used to, it was a pretty big shock and it just kind of, yeah, made me realize that I have to think a little bit more in advance about some of the stuff that I haven't had, had to do in the past. Like, especially with all the local fabric shops being closed at the time, even going in to check it out, see if I like it was a lot more difficult. But in the end, I was able to source it, which was great, but it was definitely um, a learning experience to hear so would you guys say that um even after the pandemic you guys would be like strengthening your online presence like do you think that it'd be valuable in the long run to do things more like on a digital in a digital way i would say definitely i think um not just it's great to have revenue coming in from different standpoints if you can do if you can manage an online um and offline business but also driven by covid um people's shopping behaviors are just going to change. So people are through this have learned and have become a lot more comfortable with shopping online. Um, so it's just adds one more way for people to add to cart or become aware of your brand or get it in, get it into their hands. So definitely. That'd be good to know for the entrepreneurs uh, in the audience. Um, moving on. What are some type of what are some types of support you wish that you could have received during the pandemic? Although that um, I know that Sarah and Nikki and Kelly didn't have to pivot all that much, but were there struggles you encountered that you just wish that you know were kind of compensated for? Um, I think for us, because this uh, large jump in sales. Um, meant that we had to replenish our inventory pretty quickly and we weren't necessarily prepared for that level of growth. Um, and growth is expensive. You can, you can grow too fast and, and kind of lose track of your cash flow. Cash flow is really important right now. Um, so what that meant for us is that we had to invest in a lot more inventory, put a lot more expense out um, which kind of put a strain on our cash flow. So, um, and being a small business and not having some mechanisms in because we're still pretty small, we, we, we don't have a CRA the way we organize. We, we don't qualify for some of the programs that are existing out there. So um, what I would have liked to have seen some, some help to these like smaller social impact businesses that are really working to make change. And I think these are the businesses that are going to really pull through these times. These businesses are focusing more on people and planet. So I think just a more, a quicker accessibility to some of those mechanisms, because we're even still waiting for that. And we're like how many weeks into this now? So we're, we're grateful to be hanging in, but um, yeah, we would appreciate some sort of support some sort of uh, funding support early on. Mm -hmm. Anyone else? Yeah, I'll speak to this too. So 
I'm actually grateful for the support that we've been able to have during the pandemic. So at Rockology, we received the $40,000 Canadian emergency business account loan, which has certainly helped. But I will say that, you know, we're, we've been able to be considered an essential business. So we've been able to keep our doors open. But, you know, if we were a retail storefront, we had to shut our doors for months, that $40,000 wouldn't cut it. Um, but then there also have been some other grant programs that have opened up as well. So we just actually got a, we got approved for a, a $5,000 Canadian agricultural partnership grant, which allows us to invest in our e-business. And then there's also this um, Facebook grant for small businesses as well, that I think is still open until Tuesday to apply for. That's good to know. Thank you. Um, what are, well, I guess just sort of touched on this, as we said that shopping habits are going to be completely different after the pandemic, since people are more comfortable shopping online. But just like for the entrepreneurs that are listening to the audience, what are some changes you're expecting to see in businesses in general after the pandemic? Um, I can jump in. Um, I think there's quite a few changes that are going to come um, with people uh, being more adapt to, to living at home or, or shopping from in within their home. Um, I think that in-person shopping will still hold a purpose, but I think it's going to be more of an experience rather than actually purchasing a good. You're like each square foot of someone's stores and become 10 times more valuable because they're going to have a lot fewer people going in at any given time. So I think when you go into a store, they're really gonna have to sell you and there's gonna be a lot more of an awe factor in each store that you go into. Um, because of the growth of, of e-commerce, I think there's, it's gonna be the demise of department stores. People are not gonna wanna go in and touch a thousand pieces of product that a thousand other people have touched and having these huge department stores that are just loaded with product but don't have that experience component to it um, are gonna, in, in, uh, like the research and stuff that I've been looking at, I think it's going to fall and people are going to put a lot more emphasis and energy into focus uh, into shopping local with um, brands that maybe they know the owner or it's like they feel like they could know the owner a little bit more and we realize how important it is that we support our communities. Um, I mean, we see it on the panel here. We're all small brands and, and I feel like we've all seen such growth during this time because people want to support, you know, their neighbor that they know is starting a brand or, or whatever it may be. Um, as well, because green companies typically have shorter supply chains, I think it makes it a little bit easier for them to rapidly um, produce product and get product out there, which allows for us to um, pivot and be a little bit stronger luckily in this environment whereas the huge department stores I'm sure like Sarah as you mentioned everything was sold out when you tried to find products because you're buying from these much bigger players while the smaller players are able to pivot a little bit more so um, all of that I think at the end of the day <laughs> leads to growth of local more sustainable brands um, and especially like with government supporting brands like us um, it will help drive drive that forward that's interesting so it's like more of a theatrical experience than when you go in and buy stuff rather than like sears racks upon racks i think so, I think so. that'd be really interesting it's like every store with glossier you walk in and there's like totally anyway. really i, I really look forward to that <laughs> sorry i kind of like to add to that because um I'm, I'm 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 hearing terms out there too that are really popular uh that are coming into the vernacular uh, hyper local Hyper local, uh, supporting local business, building community. We 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 like we love our city. We love strong communities, and the only way we can build strong communities is to support local businesses, and support Canadian brands, so that we can uh, we can we can be sustainable. We can create a, a a new a new way of doing business, and and what I think expanding beyond that is also I think people in this time of the pandemic are taking time to reflect on their values what's important to them, what is meaningful for them in their life, where they spend their money, how they choose to spend their money. We're witnessing right now a, a, a whole upheaval in our sort of understanding of what's important 
So I think when we, when we peel back and understand what's really important to us, when we come out on the other side, I think we will see a lot, of, a lot more collaborative um, efforts. I know in the space of, of, of low waste businesses, a lot of these local businesses are supporting each other, actually. We're not so, com there's comp competition, but there's also a recognition that the market is massive and it's con if we work together and collaborate, we can build something better, you know? So uh, sure. I just want to, it's like on the front of my store, I have a saying by um, Buckminster Fuller. I have it on the glass, it's pretty bold. Is you can't change something by fighting the existing reality. If you want to change something, you have to create a new model to, that makes the old model obsolete. So I think this is the opportunity where people can use their, their, what they really want to see for their future to bring these new ideas into the playing field. So I think we're going to, we, we have an opportunity. I'm, I'm kind of excited. I'm excited by these, by young people coming with their ideas and building new business. So I think, I think this is a turning point for, for humanity. A cultural reset. <laughs> It's sort of like what uh, Aaron said, you know, like how you have to change your mindset and the best you can do in these situations is to adapt rather than like self-pity. Um, we actually got a question in the comments. Um, Anna has a question for all panelists. Do you think you're positioned well enough well to pick up the additional demand from consumers? And what do you think is still missing to switch to more localized consumer structures? And where are your supplies? Where? I'm sorry and like where your supply chains are geographically. Sorry, tripping over my words there. Sorry, will you repeat the first, the first part of the question? Um, do you think you're positioned well enough to pick up the additional demand from consumers? And what do you think is still missing to switch to a more localized, to more localized consumer structures? And she wants to know where your local su supply chains are geographically. I mean, your local supply chains are geographically. Um, yeah, okay, so the first question, currently, yes, uh, for me, we were positioned to take up the local, or sorry, the influx of revenue during this time. Um, honestly, it was a fluke because the show that we were supposed to go at where we like bring in a lot of inventory from, um, ended up getting the camp canceled the morning of so we had all that inventory um, So now it's kind of like as it sells out it sells out and Whatever it, I mean we still have a few of our best sellers. So um, We were lucky there in terms of where our supply chains are we we partnered with a manufacturer uh, who is overseas, but they have incredible um, community um, growth initiatives within the, the facility itself um, they practice fair trade and fair wage um, guidelines and um, very sustainable initiatives so that is overseas which yes it would make it difficult to um, to be able to bring inventory in but we also have um, like blank inventory and we do all of our printing tagging packaging within Toronto itself so that makes it a little bit easier to, to shake up what we're able to have on our site but the like body of our shirts for this one for example is made overseas and then like we print the elephant and all the logos uh within toronto thank you hopefully i answered most of the questions there anyone else i can jump in as well so um in terms of scrunchies from scraps i think that i think it's been positioned quite well to deal with the extra demand, um, especially with my products on Etsy. I think a lot of people were trying to, to support local. A lot of what Nikki was saying, like taking that reflection and saying, what can I do now? I'm at home. I'm looking at more things. I want to do something. I want to buy something, you know, pick me up. It's a small thing, but it's nice. It's fun, you know? So um, I think that that's been really great. And especially a lot of people buying, you know, even within Toronto or a lot throughout Canada and just being able to say, okay, this is from a local maker. Um, I think has been been great and I think that that's been a real opportunity for me and then in terms of where I'm supplying I've actually been getting all of my fabrics pretty locally uh, a lot of my scraps have actually come from shop and tailor which is a tailor shop at college in Ossington and then from a t uh, from a dressmaker up in Richmond Hill and then in terms of my elastic with my elastic journey I already talked about um, I originally was sourcing that from a company in the US but then since that happened I then was able to 
uh, source it locally from a fabric shop right directly here in Toronto. So that actually ended up being pretty positive that I could also support local myself. That's great. Yeah. Um, let's move on to our next question. Uh, what would you like the average consumer know about small businesses in light of this pandemic? I can go. Um, unless someone else has something. I talk, I've been talking a lot. Uh, sure, I can go first. Um, I guess for us being in the food industry, um, I, I, it'd be great for people to know all of the added costs that we've had to absorb, um, but we can't raise our prices in order to stay competitive. So a few of these costs would be supplies for food and safety at our facility, including masks and sanitizers. And also we are a, a small team at our production facility, but for safety measures, we, we feel public transportation is too much of a risk right now. And so since March, one of our production employees, we have been paying for a driver to drive her to work every day and drop her off. So we have been, it's about $60 a day. So we have been absorbing this cost every single day in order to keep her safe and to protect, protect everyone at the facility. And then also we have seen our supply chain impacted. So we've seen the price of sunflower and pumpkin seeds significantly increase during this time. And it's become harder to source certain ingredients such as our superfoods like raw cacao powder. So we've had to switch suppliers and are paying more for some of these ingredients right now. That's really, that's really unexpected. Thank you for sharing us, sharing the behind the scenes with us. Yeah, especially in food too, you just want, you know, you're touching the food, you're so involved that you really want to take all those safety measures and then there are those added costs. And also too, you're, you're doing things a little bit slower too so that everyone in the production facility while making food keeps their distance and all of that. So it's a little bit slower too. Thank you so much for sharing the insight. Um, is there anyone else that would jump in before I move on to a different question or? Um, I have a few points. I would say if like what I want the average customer to know about small businesses is how important it is to shop local and shop within your community. And just because you're choosing a local brand doesn't mean you're shutting out the rest of the world. It just means that you're supporting your community for this purchase or just think about it a little bit more. Um, like Tara is saying, like she's putting in so much care and so much thoughtfulness and making sure that it's safe for anyone purchasing and not to like dig the company, but I don't know that you'd experience that amount of care or paying that much for an individual um, employee from a bigger company, but in these small community-based businesses you do, and that's not just like employer to employee, but I think customer service on a smaller brand is also like exponentially better than you're gonna get. So while you might be paying a little bit of a premium by shopping with a, a more local brand, as much as we try not to, it typically happens, you're supporting like your neighbors and, and such a bigger cause and um, it's so important to like drive that into a, the economy. And then even from like, um, an environmental standpoint, so many, there's so many reasons that a small brand helps drive down a carbon footprint. So from like whatever perspective is more interesting to you, I think there's always a reason to shop more local than shop from a bigger, um, more corporate company. Thank you. <laughs> I guess that sort of brings us into our next question. Um, what changes to the economy are you expecting to see, like moving forward from this point? Like, do you think that maybe, you know, smaller entrep uh, entrep entrepreneurship projects are going to like have a bigger fighting chance moving forward? Like even past the pa pandemic. So like it would now, would you say that now is a good time to start, you know, thinking about your own idea to have a startup? I think it's always a good idea. <laughs> There's okay. always 
tough times. It's always passion is going to die at some point and it comes back and there's tough days. And obviously this is a particularly tough time for the world and not just the pandemic, but um, I think a lot of our eyes have been open to what other individuals are living through. And, um, and so, so there's never a, a good time to start a business. You have to be really aware of um, the state of the world. So maybe not right now, but I would say like, if you start thinking and planning and putting the pieces together, you'll know when the right time is. You'll feel comfortable mm -hmm. ready-ish, ready-ish. I actually think it's a great time for entrepreneurs to to um, bring their um, their their new ideas, their thinking, their um, um, consideration for the future. Like I think we're in a time where witnessing our systems are not working for us. They're they're broken, and we know that we see that right now. And and it's kind of um, we're talking about restarting the economy. We're talking about restarting things that are broken. So I think, and I really encourage entrepreneurs, it's like you can be nimble because you can start small and you can create and build upon that. So you can find, you know, what works for you and, and, and expand out from there where big companies have a hard time right now. They can't, they can't pivot. They can't turn. So I, uh, and change what they're doing. So I think this is the opportunity for people to be, creative um to see what the needs are out there what what people really want based on those values and 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 start to start to build these new economic structures that will actually be more equitable for people and planet going going into the future this is really important right now this is our opportunity now to to start to make change I, I strongly agree with that. And I just wanted to echo a bit of what you're saying, Nikki. I, I think that it really is the time for, you know, anyone that has some ideas where they can really think outside the box. It's like some of us have a bit more extra time than we would usually or more time at home. We can get creative, get fun and try out new things and just explore with them. And I think this really is a time to see, you know, there is a lot of change that can be made and should be made. And why, you know, why can't we be those people to, to make that change and, and do those opportunities? Mm hmm on the topic of like adapting with the changes that we're seeing in our society like nowadays um there's a follow up question to that what are th what are things you have learned about the way you run your business during this pandemic well we kind of touched upon that and most recently with the black lives matter movement is there anything you want to change moving forward yeah it's it's a it's a lot to digest for sure. <laughs> I, I think right now everybody's going through a process of, uh, I think Aaron spoke to it earlier and we may have actually touched on it here. We're all re-educating. We're going through a bit of a process of unlearning and relearning. So, um, yeah, it's a, <laughs> I think so there's a lot of, you know, self-reflection, even from the perspective of a business owner. No. Yeah. I mean, yeah, it's, it's fine. Like, again, it's just, these are systems that aren't working. So we have really the opportunity to be, to be really like, to really like dig deep inside. Mm -hmm. This is really up to us, right? We can't expect a system to change or the world to change or anything to change because the change has to start with inside us. So, so for me, even actually when, when our company, when, when pandemic hit, we looked at it and I was like, I, I realized that, yeah, we're growing and we're going to get customers and people need soap, obviously. Um, but what became evidently most important is, is company culture and really creating companies that create um, environments for people to flourish and create and, and co-create and share rather than a pyramid structure, maybe like a web structure. I'm exploring this in my own company. I, 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 I'm a little bit older. I've been in business for been in the working world for many years. And, and I, I, I just, and there's a better way. There's a better way. So I think this is the time that we can, you know, really start to tweak maybe four day work weeks, other things, bring other values into our life besides going to work every day. Mm -hmm. to or add, bring values into our work. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. To add to that too, like the, the pandemic has really forced us to get clear on our purpose and we're, we're actually in this process of running a purpose experiment with some key stakeholders. So we're, we've sent out a questionnaire to some of our influencers and our employees and 
this feedback will really help us inform our future purpose as a business. And the biggest thing is that we want to play a larger role in our local community. And so during the pandemic, we, we launched a one for one frontline healthcare workers initiative to donate our products to healthcare workers. And we're really focusing on what is the bigger impact that we can have in the community and how we can contribute to positive social change and help build healthier, sustainable communities. So it really is a culture reset. It shakes everything up and it makes you reconsider everything on the inside. Um, we actually have another question from the chat. I don't know if everyone can see it. Like, it's from Ariana. She says, thank you to all panelists. It's very inspiring to hear from you all since timing, though deliveries are compromised during this time. My question is that what are some tips and advice that you can give to businesses that involve products that are best delivered as soon as possible, such as baked goods or organic homemade products that may be at risk for its quality while having to be kept in a storage for a long period of time. Tara, since you work in the food sector, do you have like- Yeah, yeah, so I can speak to that. So I don't know if the big, I'm curious if the baked goods, like if they have to be consumed and delivered the same day. Um, because we use, in terms of our delivery, we use a great platform called Freightcom, and we get great rates from, it compares rates from Canpar, UPS, and FedEx, and, um, but they always guarantee uh, one day shipping for Ontario, it's like two day shipping to ship out to Montreal, so it's very reliable. Um, more reliable than Canada Post. So that's a great option if it can stay longer than just same day delivery. Otherwise, if it needs to be same day delivery, I suggest you'd want like a, a personal, someone like who could deliver that same day, a driver to do that. You can also, I know with like from working at Shopify, we have um, local delivery where I don't know exactly how it works but you can like put in where all your orders are coming from and it helps like optimize the route that you'll be using um so if you are the one that's going out and delivering it you can like figure out what the best route is to drop it all off on that same day and then you can also have um curbside pickup um like figured out so that you can your customer can message you and say hey I'm here and you can go put it outside on the curb and it creates like one that you don't need to actually like, interact with them if, if that's something that they or you are un uncomfortable with, but it also creates like um, a touch point without having a physical store if, if that's something that you needed. Yeah, that's definitely helpful because I actually noticed a lot of my friends are starting their own like baking businesses where they're just baking things at home and they're driving to their friends' houses, they're donating the proceeds to charity. So that's actually really helpful knowledge. And I hope that helped the people you know, we're listening. Um, we kind of, we kind of um, touched upon all the main things that I had planned. So are there any like final words that you'd have for the, for the, for the entrepreneurs who are listening in the audience? Anyone? Words of wisdom? Words of wisdom? Yes. <laughs> I would say, I would say, um, just expanding again is like, yeah, this is a great time to start and, um, really dig deep and start. Why, why are you doing what you're doing? Because you gotta, you gotta, you gotta always reflect back on that because it's not always easy. So if your, why is your leading principle to what you're doing, then you will have a good, a, a good compass to guide you. But if you're not, so if your, why is a little bit fluffy or is it not so uh, firm then 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 it's going to be a tough ride out so be really firm on what you're doing and why what what is it that's driving you that's going to keep you going it's always good to have a clear moral compass mm -hmm. good to refer back on mm -hmm. well um anyone else i i'd echo the why component um and if anyone needs to like figure out how to answer the why, watch Simon Sinek's presentation on why it's killer. And it's something that my co-founder and I actually like go back and watch quite frequently. Um, if anyone's thinking of starting a company and they have a co-founder, one of 
So my co-founder is also my partner. So um, that layers in like a, a lot into starting a business. But one of the things that we have found so helpful and I, and I was actually encouraged this by one of my mentors is to figure out what the goal is of your whole company um, and align on that goal and make sure it's really clear for the both of you so that when you're making decisions or different opportunities pop up as you're, as you're growing your business, um, it makes it a much easier process to say yes or say no to different opportunities if you're aligned on that one goal because although there's many different paths to get there, um, it will narrow it down quite a bit if you keep you know, referring back to that ultimate goal um, from experience, like we lost sight of our goal a few times and we said yes to these like shiny, exciting opportunities that just threw us astray and didn't actually like lead us back to any growth or anything where that we were actually working towards. And it's easy to get really distracted. So just whether it's with a partner or yourself, just be really clear on what that goal is and then make sure you like keep referring back to it to make sure that one, that still is your goal and two, the decisions you're making are leading you to there. That definitely is very helpful in like all areas of life. I feel like as a person, it's good to know, like, who are you? What do you want? And yeah, it also ties back to what Aaron said earlier about having a major goal and then working backwards to find all the micro goals. And we have, we have one last question before we head into our little 10 minute snack break um, before our, our next session of networking. Um, so it comes to Alejandro. He says, hi, I'm Ecuador and my startup is Banana Plates. I would like to ask for recommendations and applications for capital that helps green businesses. And he says, it's very inspiring to hear from everyone at this meeting. One, one option is um, York University has this York Entrepreneurship Development Institute that I was part of and they have um, this program for those under 29 launching businesses. It's an accelerator program and uh, there are funding opportunities as well after you go through their whole program, uh, up to $5,000 to get started. But there's also another program that you can get up to $30,000 in funding. So Yeti is a great resource. And just if you haven't taken any business courses, it's um, just overall, I speak so high, I recommend it highly uh, for the value of Yeti and the group of professors that are involved with Yeti. So definitely check them out. Thank you so much, Tara. So I guess that concludes our panelist session. Um, a lot, uh, Alejandro says thank you so much. I'm not sure if you guys can actually see the chat, so I'm just reading everything aloud. Um, Austin thanked everyone for dropping these gems and Ariana said, Thank you to all the ama amazing panelists that we have with us today. And um, Nikki actually pasted a link of the TED Talk of how great leaders inspire action. So once again, thank you so much for joining me and Pitcher Green today, devoting your time to educate us on some, on some burning questions we had on green business. So now is sort of like a 10 minute break for everyone to grab a snack, get refreshed before we get sorted into our rooms for our next networking session. Um, panelists, feel free to stick around for the networking session. I'm sure a lot of people have more questions to ask you. But if you have to go, that's all right. Yeah, and if anyone wants to reach out, or I, I have to jump off, I'm sorry, but um, you feel free, I'll maybe share my email. If anyone has questions, feel free to reach out or just DM on uh, Awoke and Aware on Instagram. And it's me organizing it. <laughs> For managing it. But my email is there as well. Okay, awesome. So we're just going to take a, I think, five, five minute break. Um, I think I just need to, yeah, there. Um, just get a snack, get some water, go to the bathroom or something. And uh, we'll be back for our networking sessions. We have four breakout rooms and I'm just gonna put you in randomly, but there will be someone from Pitch It Green moderating uh, the networking session. So see you soon.